Hi you guys, it's Ms. Pryle. Um, I just wanted to reach out to you today and let you know that I'm thinking about you and I hope you guys are doing all right at home. Um, I wanted to also give you some thoughts to, to think about, a little bit of inspiration for today. Um, if you wanted, this is not anything that will ever be graded. It is not part of the official class. You will never have a test on this. I just thought I'd reach out and let you know that I'm thinking about you and um, maybe you'd enjoy kind of hearing some thoughts um, and a little bit of, of inspiration for the day. The other thing that I thought would be cool is um, reading a book aloud. So so in part two of this video, I'm gonna start a, a book that I think you might like, and we can read a little bit of that each day too. But the first thing I wanna show you is um, a painting that you're gonna recognize. And you should remember that. We looked at this in the fall, the great wave off Kanajawa. Um, and we we probably, actually it was probably December, maybe even January, it was right before midterms, we looked at this one. But I thought this was so great to kind of revisit at this point because um, we talked about the men in the boat and how they're all sort of crouching and, and bracing for the wave. And it does really feel like that now, doesn't it? Um, that the wave is kind of hanging over us. And in the back, we talked about how that's Mount Fuji back there. And um, the perspective of it is so small, right? It's, it's actually this huge mountain, but the perspective that the artist is kind of painting from makes the mountain look so tiny. Normally it's, it's massive and it makes the wave look so big. And certainly it is a great wave because that's the title, of course, but the perspective is a little bit um, different than if you were standing somewhere else or if you were in the sky. Um, so I feel like this is a good metaphor for what we're sort of facing right now. We're, we're in the boats, we're crouching down, we're getting ready for the wave and uh, it seems really big and in the moment it definitely is um, but at we as we also talked about um, with this painting it's all about going with the flow right and it's all about kind of taking it in stride and doing what you can to protect yourself of course uh, but also just sort of trusting that you're going to make it through I feel like these are all things that we discussed when we talked about this painting. And that takes me to um, uh, our poem for today uh, from the Tao Te Ching. And let me see if I can get myself back up here. And I'm going to move myself over there. Good. So hopefully you can see me. Um, the Tao Te Ching number 16. Empty your mind of all thoughts. Let your heart be at peace. Watch the turmoil of beings, but contemplate their return. Each separate being in the universe returns to the common source. Returning to the source is serenity. If you don't realize the source, you stumble in confusion and sorrow. When you realize where you come from, you naturally become tolerant, disinterested, amused, kind-hearted as a grandmother, dignified as a king. Immersed in the wonder of the Tao, you can deal with whatever life brings you. And so you guys will remember we looked at a lot of selections from the Tao Te Ching in January and it was all about this main idea of you stay centered and you go with the flow of life. So I feel like that's really important to where we are right now. You stay centered and you take care of yourself, but we go with the flow and we ride out the wave and um, we'll all be together on the other side. So that's a little bit of inspiration for today from World Literature. Um, I'm gonna hit pause and then I'm gonna show you the book that I was thinking would be neat to kind of read aloud, so hang on. So here we are, I'm back. Um, and I was thinking Tuesdays with Maury might be fun to kind of read aloud. Again, this is not required at all. This is complete 
um, something sort of extra and inspirational to do. If you have some time on your hands, um, feel free. I'll, I'll be reading a little bit of this every day. Um, you do not have to listen. You do not have to listen to any of these posts. If there's something you need to know for the class, I'll type it out in Google Classroom. Uh, but these are just going to be uh, some extra sort of thinking and for you to do and, and maybe just enjoyable because Tuesdays with Maury is a wonderful book, completely inspirational. Um, some of you might have read it even already. So let me get to the first chapter here and we'll begin. The first chapter is called The Curriculum. The last class of my old professor's life took place once a week in his house by a window in the study where he could watch a small hibiscus plant shed its pink leaves. The class met on Tuesdays. It began after breakfast. The subject was the meaning of life. It was taught from experience. No grades were given, but there were oral exams each week. You were expected to respond to questions and you were expected to pose questions of your own. You were also required to perform physical tasks now and then, such as lifting the professor's head to a comfortable spot on the pillow or placing his glasses on the bridge of his nose. Kissing him goodbye earns you extra credit. No books were required, yet many topics were covered, including love, work, community, family, aging, forgiveness, and finally, death. The last lecture was brief, only a few words. A funeral was held in lieu of a graduation. Although no final exam was given, you were expected to produce one long paper on what was learned. That paper is presented here. The last class of my old professor's life had only one student. I was the student. It is the late spring of 1979, a hot, sticky Saturday afternoon. Hundreds of us sit together, side by side, in rows of wooden, wooden folding chairs on the main campus lawn. We wear blue nylon robes. We listen impatiently to long speeches. When the ceremony is over, we throw our caps in the air and we are officially graduated from college, the senior class of Brandeis University in the city of Waltham, Massachusetts. For many of us, the curtain has just come down on childhood. Afterward, I find Maury Schwartz, my favorite professor, and introduce him to my parents. He is a small man who takes small steps as if a strong wind could at any time whisk him up into the clouds. In his graduation day robe, he looks like a cross between a biblical prophet and a Christmas elf. He has sparkling blue-green eyes, thinning silver hair that spills onto his forehead, big ears, a triangular nose, and tufts of graying eyebrows. Although his teeth are crooked and his lower ones are slanted back, as if someone had once punched them in, when he smiles, it's as if you just told him the first joke on earth. He tells my parents how I took every class he taught. He tells them, you have a special boy here, Embarrassed, I look at my feet. Before we leave, I hand my professor a present, a tan briefcase with his initials on the front. I bought this the day before at a shopping mall. I didn't want to forget him. Maybe I didn't want him to forget me. Mitch, you are one of the good ones, he says, admiring the briefcase. Then he hugs me. I feel his thin arms around my back. I am taller than he is, and when he holds me, I feel awkward, older, as if I were the parent and he were the child. He asks if I will stay in touch, and without hesitation, I say, of course. When he steps back, I see that he is crying. The Syllabus 
His death sentence came in the summer of 1994. Looking back, Maury knew something bad was coming long before that. He knew it the day he gave up dancing. He had always been a dancer, my old professor. The music didn't matter. Rock and roll, big band, the blues, he loved them all. He would close his eyes and with a blissful smile begin to move to his own sense of rhythm. It wasn't always pretty, but then he didn't worry about a partner. Maury danced by himself. He used to go to this church in Harvard Square every Wednesday night for something called Dance Free. They had flashing lights and booming speakers, and Maury would wander in among the mostly student crowd wearing a white t-shirt and black sweatpants and a towel around his neck. And whatever music was playing, that's the music to which he danced. He'd do the Lindy to Jimi Hendrix. He twisted and twirled. He waved his arms like a conductor on amphetamines until sweat was dripping down the middle of his back. No one there knew he was a prominent doctor of sociology with years of experience as a college professor and several well-respected books. They just thought he was some old nut. Once he brought a tango tape and got them to play it over the speakers. Then he commandeered the floor, shooting back and forth like some hot Latin lover. When he finished, everyone applauded. He could have stayed in that moment forever. But then the dancing stopped. He developed asthma in his 60s. His breathing became labored. One day he was walking along the Charles River and a cold burst of wind left him choking for air. He was rushed to the hospital and injected with adrenaline. A few years later, he began to have trouble walking. At a birthday party for a friend, he stumbled inexplicably. Another night, he fell down the steps of a theater, startling a small crowd of people. Give him air, someone yelled. He was in his 70s by this point, so they whispered old age and helped him to his feet. But Maury, who was always more in touch with his insides than the rest of us, knew something else was wrong. This was more than old age. He was weary all the time. He had trouble sleeping. He dreamt he was dying. He began to see doctors, lots of them. They tested his blood. They tested his urine. They put a scope up his rear end and looked inside his intestines. Finally, when nothing else could be found, one doctor ordered a muscle biopsy, taking a small piece out of Maury's calf. The lab report came back suggesting a neurological problem, and Maury was brought in for yet another series of tests. In one of those tests, he sat in a special seat as they zapped him with electrical current, an electric chair of sorts, and studied his neurological responses. We need to check this further, the doctor said, looking over his results. Why, Maury asked, what is it? We're not sure. Your times are slow. His times were slow. What did that mean? Finally, on a hot, humid day in August 1994, Maury and his wife, Charlotte, went to the neurologist office and he asked them to sit before he broke the news. Maury had amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, a brutal, unforgiving illness of the neurological system. There was no known cure. How did I get it? Maury asked. Nobody knew. Is it terminal? Yes. So I'm going to die? Yes, you are, the doctor said. I'm very sorry. He sat with Maury and Charlotte for nearly two hours, patiently answering their questions. When they left, the doctor gave them some information on ALS, little pamphlets, as if they were opening a bank account. Outside, the sun was shining and people were going about their business. A woman ran to put money in the parking meter. Another carried groceries. Charlotte had a million thoughts running through her mind. How much time do we have left? How will we manage? 
how 